Hello, my name is Christine Pere, and welcome to the AREA webinar um, on interoperability and standards. This is the February 11th, 2020 webinar on the topic of the IEEE BRAR Standards Committee and activities this committee is taking pertaining to augmented reality. It's my pleasure to welcome um, our guest here, Dr. Yu Yuan, and um, all of our attendees. Uh, this broadcast is being recorded and therefore it will be archived and available on the AREA website. Before I hand over the presenter mode to um, Yu Yuan, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the AREA. Uh, then uh, he will present. You all attendees will remain in listen only mode. However, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can do that using the question uh, control panel um, in the GoToWebinar application. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, as I said, I'll be introducing the area and telling you a little bit about our program for interoperability and standards. Then we will have our, our guest speaker and then take questions from the audience. Uh, the area is um, an alliance, a consortium of companies that represents and is seeking to foster the development of a comprehensive ecosystem. For us, what that means is um, enterprises who are the customers of augmented reality pro solution providers um, are uh, generating new requirements all the time and um, they need support and to collaborate with one another on these uh, topics of augmented reality introduction and uh, scaling. We also have members who are the providers of products and services for the A enterprise AR ecosystem. These providers work in collaboration many times with non-commercial entities. The Entities, the non commercial and academic entities, are often delivering um, basic or applied research in new areas. But there's also a lot of research being conducted in the provider segment, and this um, supports the better adoption in enterprises. So we are um, facilitating the communication and collaboration of these three ecosystem segments. And we do that. Um, through these four pillars. We provide content in a variety of places and formats. We also support member as well as the larger community uh, in, in providing networking and, and um, a, a way for people to share their experiences. We're supporting programs that will close the skills gaps of AR professionals. And finally, we have committees several committees that are reducing the barriers to adoption. Um, the Interoperability and Standards Program was uh, started in 2019 when members began to sense that they uh, were experiencing obstacles uh, in their deployments. And in particular, we like to show the area schema of customer needs. So. Uh, we believe that many, many industries and people in a variety of different settings and different use cases uh, have the potential to benefit from augmented reality. And as we go down through this um, linear stack of boxes, the requirements get more and more precise. And in particular, what we're detecting, and I think it's being communicated by the area members, is that they are encountering situations where they have many different vendors, providers of solutions in their enterprise networks and in their locations and facilities. And they need to integrate those into a, a, um, a complete uh, system that doesn't require any special engineering. And in addition, in order to achieve that integration level at a deeper level, they also want to um, 
have their enterprise and operational management software, and in some cases, uh, hardware, um, uh, tightly integrated with augmented reality. And so the, the needs are um, uh, varied, and, um, but they fall in largely those two important categories. So this program is helping people to become more uh, aware and knowledgeable about these problems and how to achieve interoperability, and then to uh, advance that uh, through a variety of uh, programs. The, the tactics, what we're doing to target those specific interoperability barriers and interoperability as a, as a domain um, are these five. We uh, want to expand the, the awareness and understanding of all people uh, in enterprise AR on the subject of interoperability. We want to support the standards development organizations in their work and the working groups in particular by getting information to the right people in the right format. And at such a time when there are draft specifications before they are ratified, we are uh, involved in those uh, the review and providing comments to the uh, to the uh, the members of working groups. And then we also want to focus on interoperability in events and. Uh, We've got some of those coming up. So then finally, as implementation or as standards become developed, we can support the, um, the testing and, and the uh, building reference implementations. So that's the area's um, uh, goals in promoting interoperability. And, in, and uh, we would also like to now welcome um, uh, Yu Yuan to speak to us about the IEEE Standards Association and the things that it's doing uh, in the domain of augmented reality. So thank you, Yuan, and I allow you, uh, invite you to present yourself and your slides. Thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present in, uh, our work here uh, to the uh, area. So could you see my full screen now? Yes, see it perfectly in full full slide mode. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, yeah. So I'm going to uh talk about uh, IEEE uh standards development and uh, also the IEEE uh AR standards project uh as of today. Uh, so I'm currently I'm serving as the chair of the IEEE VR and AR standards committee and also the IEEE P twenty forty eight working group. Uh, so before we go to the uh, part of IEEE AR projects, I'd like to give you an overview about how standards are developed within IEEE. Uh, because uh, different SDOs uh, have very different structures and uh, different ways uh, to develop standards. So I hope understanding how IEEE is uh, working in terms of developing standards would be helpful. Uh, in case uh, any one of you are interested in uh, participating in our work. Uh, so basically this is, a, this picture is about uh, uh, the entire IEEE uh, organizational structure. Uh, actually, I have been feeling that uh, I've never seen a very perfect diagram uh, showing the, the IEEE structure uh, according to my uh, accurate understanding, but this one is the best one I could find for the purpose of today. So you can say that IEEE actually is counted as the largest professional organization in the world with over uh, 220,000 members all over the world. And there are several major boards, we call that major boards, uh, reporting to the IEEE board of directors uh, including uh, standards association, uh, technical activities, uh, public, uh, publication activities, uh, MGA uh, member and uh, geographic uh, uh, activities and educational activities, uh, <clears throat> and also the actual USA. So uh, basically, uh, all the standards are developed uh, 
based on the collaboration uh, between technical activities and the standards association. Uh, Ma IEEE manages standards activities uh, from two different perspectives. Uh, technical activities, including its society and the councils, are uh, managing the technical perspective of standards activities. And uh, the standards association, typically uh, called the IEEE SA, uh, is taking care of the procedural perspective, <clears throat> which means uh, for a new uh, project, uh, first of all, uh, you need to find a sponsor uh, in the technical activities, activities uh, which typically is a standards, act, uh, standards committee uh, in the technical activities society or council uh, to agree to sponsor your new project, uh, which means they are uh, feeling comfortable uh, with the technical aspects of your projects. Uh, and then you will submit your project to IEEE SA. Uh, there's a so-called standards board, and uh, the standards board uh, will have its uh, new standards committee to review all the new proposals uh, for new projects and recommend for uh, approval or disapproval by the standards board. And uh, along with the uh, uh, project uh, progress, uh, the project will also be managed, uh, in other words, reporting to two bosses. Uh, one is the sponsoring uh, standards committee under, the, under a society or council within the technical activities. And uh, also another boss uh, is the actual PSA. Uh, they will keep monitoring uh, the progress of your working, uh, working group uh, of your project. And they will also assign a staff, uh, a staff person to uh, serve as a, a program manager uh, to facilitate the working uh, working group operations and also monitoring um, if all your operations are uh, fully complying with the policies and procedures. Uh, that's what I said. Uh, IEEE is taking care of the procedural perspective and uh, uh, technical activities uh, through its society and the councils are uh, taking care of the uh, technical perspective of the standards projects. And you can say that uh, there are several uh, different uh, committees under the IEEE SA uh, standards board. Um, so I should say that those numbers, like the over uh, 1,000 and 300 active standards and 800 projects, they are not uh, all belong to uh, IEEE SA. Actually, most of most of them uh, technically are belonging to technical acti activities. But the technical activities, we typically call that TA, TA and SA uh, collaborate to manage those uh, standards and the projects uh, from both technical and uh, procedural perspectives. And th those numbers are very current. I just uh, updated these this numbers um, yesterday. IEEE now has over 1,300 active standards, including the very famous uh, Wi-Fi, uh, which is IEEE 802.11. There are already over 20 billion devices equipped with Wi-Fi technology in the world. And uh, there are also over 800 active projects, which means those are to be, uh, uh, those are under development uh, standards. Uh, our 2040 series uh, VR and AR standards are part of this 800 projects. So um, this is uh, uh, about the uh, overall organizational structure of IEEE from the standards perspective. And uh, as I mentioned, the standards committees, uh, standards committees, they, they are uh, substructures under the IEEE TA technical activities societies or council. And uh, they are also equivalent to uh, other SDOs, TSA or study group. If we use ISO as an example, 
IEEE standards act, uh, committees are equi equivalent to ISO technical committee, like uh, uh, the uh, TC1, TC204, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, typically, uh, several IEEE standards committees also have official liaison relationship uh, with ISO TCs. And also, uh, the IEEE standards committees are equivalent to the SG's study groups uh, uh, within ITU. Uh, so uh, basically, this is the very uh, important structure within IEEE, that all the standards activities, all the working groups are managed by uh, their uh, corresponding standards uh, committees. Uh, according to which technical areas uh, they fall into. So uh, I'm currently serving as the chair of the VR and AR standards committee, which means uh, our committee is authorized to oversee and manage the uh, projects in the and the standards in the areas of uh, VR and AR, MR, XR, whatever. And uh, I also mentioned that I'm serving as the chair of the working group uh, 2048. Uh, I'd like to uh, clarify that uh, uh, currently uh, the 2048 working group is the only working group under the IEEE VR and AR uh, standards committee. However, uh, it's not supposed to be always like that, uh, which means we are also uh, welcoming uh, new proposals uh, for establishing new working groups uh, under the uh, VR and AR standards committee, the IEEE VR and AR standards committee that I'm chairing. So you can see the, uh, the responsibilities of uh, standards committees on the screen, so I'm not reading all of them. Uh, the next uh, uh, very important uh, structure, actually, this is where the standards are actually developed, being developed, is working groups. So this is very similar to other SDOs. Uh, it's the working groups who write standards. Uh, standards committees are just uh, taking care of the uh, managing, overseeing responsibilities, uh, but uh, uh, it's the working groups who write standards. So a uh, working group uh, is a very um, strict concept in IEEE. So you only need to, uh, so you uh, you can only call yourself your group a working group uh, after you get approval uh, from uh, both the standards committee that sponsoring uh, sponsors your working group and the SSB uh, IEEE Standards Association Standards Board uh, who officially approves your a uh, project proposal, uh, then uh, you can call that, uh, you can say that your working group is uh, official. And uh, uh, there are actually two different types of uh, working groups, uh, individual-based and entity-based. So with the IEEE, uh, both types have uh, quite a few successful uh, examples. And uh, these are actually two exchangeable options uh, when you want to initiate a new project. You can choose if you like the individual-based working group or entity-based working group. The major difference is that individual working group uh, is like every working group member uh, is an individual uh, and uh, has one vote. And the entity-based working group uh, means uh, the working group members are entities, which means companies, institutions, organizations, and uh, each entity has only one vote. And uh, there are uh, several other restrictions. So individual-based working groups are generally open to everyone. You don't have to be an IEEE member. You don't uh, have to be an IEEE uh, SA member in order to be a member of the an individual-based working group. Only if you want to be uh, serving as the officers of working group, you will have to be both IEEE member and the IEEE SA member. But if you are just uh, working in that working group as a, a voting member rather than officer, you don't need to 
uh, pay the actual play membership fee. But entity working groups are different. Uh, they are open to actual play as a corporate members only, which means you need to, your organization, your affiliation need to pay the actual play corporate membership fee, uh, which is typically uh, the annual uh, price is from uh, 4,200 US dollars to over uh, 10,000 US dollars, depending on the type of your organization. If you are a school, a non-profit organization, you pay the lowest price. Uh, if you are a company, your price uh, varies depending on your uh, annual revenue. So, uh, but actually, actually never forces anyone to choose uh, either individual based working group or entity based working group. So it's actually the working group's own uh, choice. Like for example, for for many reasons, uh, we choose the the uh, we we choose the entity based working group for our twenty forty eight series. One of the uh, reasons is that we want to uh make our working group uh operate like a consortium uh, which is basically entity based uh so there are actually pros and cons uh in terms of individual based and entity based uh for today uh i will uh, focus on the entity based working group because we are going to uh introduce the 2040 series which is based on the entity working group but uh, as i mentioned before uh, on behalf of the IEEE VR and the AR standard committee, uh, I'm welcoming uh, new proposals to establish individual-based working groups, if this is your choice. So, entity-based working group membership, there are actually uh, three different uh, categories. Members, <coughs> the entity need to be an IEEE SA advanced corporate member, uh, in order to uh, become a voting member uh, or even a non-voting member uh, for the entity-based working group. So typically, uh, every IEEE SA advanced corporate member who attended the kickoff meeting uh, of a new working group uh, will have the right to request to be a voting member of that working group immediately. Uh, but if you miss the if you missed the kickoff meeting, after that, typically you will be required to attend two consecutive meetings uh, before you can request the voting membership uh, for a working group. The similar uh, rules also applies to individual based working groups. Like uh, if you attend the, the kickoff meeting, you can immediately become a voting member. But if you missed the kickoff meeting, you will need to attend either two consecutive meetings or two of the last four meetings of the working working group to become a voting member, and uh, those uh, details vary uh, depends on the uh, particular working group's PMP. We call that a PMP, which is stands for policies and the procedures. Uh, in addition to members, uh, entity-based working group could also have observers. So. Observers, uh, uh, if you only pay the basic IEEE corporate member uh, fee, uh, you are permitted to attend the working groups as observer, which means you have no uh, co uh, voting rights, but uh, you can observe all the meetings. But uh, to be honest with you, in my humble opinion, uh, that is uh, not really worth the money. So my recommendation, if you really want to participate in an entity-based working group or if you want to uh, initiate your own entity working group, I would strongly recommend you to be uh, become an uh, advanced corporate member uh, so that you have the full privileges of the IEEE advanced corporate membership. Um, especially non-corporate entities uh, may attend one meeting to plan so if you are not a member uh, of the actual uh, corporate program, uh, you can still attend one working group meeting to determine if you are really interested in becoming a corporate member. So that is like a teaser trailer. 
and uh, experts. So uh, in some cases, um, a working group chooses to uh, invite some individual experts to help with their work. Uh, but there's also a very strict rule uh, uh, about that. So the working group has to vote uh, on that uh, to allow either an entity or an individual to be invited to attend up to three meetings as an expert. So, uh, which may be uh, good enough in some cases, like uh, uh, during, a uh, uh, during a particular stage uh, of the standards development, you may need some advice or input from a particular expert, and uh, you can invite uh, uh, her or him to attend uh, up to three meetings, which may be enough. But if uh, the expert need to uh, attend more meetings, to uh, uh, get more involved in your working group, working group uh, uh, efforts, uh, you may need to consider uh, how to uh, bring uh, uh, his or her uh, affiliation uh, into this working group as a official corporate member. And uh, so this diagram shows the standard development life cycle. Uh, Everything starts from an idea, like uh, we find a gap, we find a standardization need, we need to develop a standard. This is so-called idea. Then we need to uh, write a very simple uh, a proposal, we call that a PAR, P -A -R, Project Authorization Request. And uh, that uh, PAR will be sent to, you You will choose who is your sponsoring standards uh, committee, who is your uh, sponsor based on the uh, parse technical area. Uh, there are currently uh, barely over 100 different uh, standards committees within entire IEEE. Uh, some uh, like uh, uh, we have smart devices, we have VR and AR, uh, we have digital, um, well, we have blockchain, have digital finances, uh, oceanic engineering, photonics uh, uh, engineering, things like that. So you need to choose uh, the right sponsor based on uh, the technical area that uh, your proposal is about. And the sponsor will help you go through, uh, go through the process of getting the approval from both the sponsor itself and also the actual ASA standards board. So after the project is approved, uh, you will be authorized to kick off your working group and then the working group will develop the draft. And after you finish the draft, uh, there's a so-called IEEE ballot and public review, which means uh, other guys, uh, 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 other entities or individuals, uh, in addition to your working group members, uh, will be invited to vote and comment uh, on the draft. And uh, eventually, when you uh, uh, go through, after you go through the ballot and the public review process, you will send the final draft to actually uh, standards association standards board again uh, to uh, for the final approval. Uh, then uh, the standard will be published, uh, and uh, you can see here it says from project approved to actually say approves the standards. Uh, it's maximum of four years, which is actually the approved life cycle for PAR, for uh, for uh, approved project acceleration request. So once you get a PAR approved, the PAR has four year life cycle. You need to finish your work uh, within the four years. But uh, in some cases, you can request uh, extension, like uh, uh, one or two years extension but uh, maximal, uh, no more than eight years totally. So the average number, uh, the average uh, uh, duration within IEEE uh, for uh, uh, standards uh, to be developed from the initiation to its release is about uh, 2.6 years, uh, but uh, in some cases that could be very fast, like uh, as short as half a year, uh, so actually, it depends on the working group itself, how fast you can deliver your, your work. 
the pro procedural efforts uh, with your sponsor and uh, with the IEEE uh, could be uh, minimized uh, and uh, some of them could be uh, operated in parallel. So it's real actually based on uh, depending on your own effort, how fast you can finish the development of, of that draft. So after the uh, release of a standard, it uh, automatically has 10 year life cycle. After 10 years, it will be either uh, you find the need to revise that uh, to uh, work on the revision, or uh, you will feel that, okay, uh, the industry uh, does not need that anymore, then it will be simply withdrawn and uh, put into an archive. So that's a, a life cycle of the standards development within IEEE. And uh, we also have some uh, details, like for example, I'd like to mention, IEEE uh, starting from a few months ago, very recently, uh, we are enforcing the so-called corporate policy, uh, which means basically everything you submitted to the working group, you presented to the working group, will automatically belong uh, IEEE, uh, will automatically become uh, IEEE copyrighted assets. So you need to follow a very, um, uh, 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 follow a template to submit uh, your contribution to IEEE working group. And uh, there are uh, several other policies you need to follow. Uh, but I'd like to clarify that some people might uh, be questioning, uh, does IEEE uh, take over everything from the uh, working group members? Of course not. IEEE only owns the copyright of the text of the standards, I should say. Uh, only uh, owns the copyright of the uh, standards themselves. But all the intellectual property, uh, like uh, uh, patents, uh, things like that, still belong to uh, the entity, uh, the, sorry, still belong to the working group members. So you collectively uh, develop a standard on the IEEE. So the standard, the, the, the book uh, itself, the copyright belongs to IEEE, but you own the, uh, uh, the original owner of the IP uh, still uh, will still be the uh, owner of the, that particular IP. You just authorize the IEEE uh, to reference that uh, patent in, in that uh, standard by sending actually a so-called LOA letter of assurance. Um, so actually is very serious about the copyright of the standards and the drafts. So you can say that uh, highlighted on this slide, do not make the draft public, do not share the draft with people who are not participants of the working group. Uh, which actually also implies that uh, if you really want to uh, follow uh, the development uh, progress of a particular working group, uh, the best way is to join the working group. Even you do not intend to make any contributions, just but want to observe, uh, the best way is still to officially join that working group. Um, so uh, there are other links. I'm not going to uh, read all of them. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I, I believe these slides could be accessible uh, after the, this webinar. So you can uh, read uh, about them uh, by yourself. Uh, okay, so now let's uh, introduce our uh, VR and AR uh, projects. So far we have 12 uh, projects, uh, which means ongoing, uh, uh, standards, uh, uh, standards projects under my 2048 working group. Uh, on the screen, you can see all of the, all of them, uh, from device testonomy and the definitions to immersive video, uh, creative matrix uh, formats, personal identity, uh, immersive audio, uh, things like that. So not all of them are relevant to. Uh, uh, AR. So today I will just uh, highlight uh, those AR related uh, projects. 
uh, for the interest of area uh, our audience today. Um, but in case you are interested in uh, uh, some other projects that I uh, do not uh, introduce the details today, you are more than welcome to contact me afterwards. So uh, I would be more than uh, glad to uh, communicate with you, and uh, hopefully you are you will be interested in join our efforts as well. Uh, before we go to the details of some selected AR projects. Uh, you may also feel that uh, if you look at the list on my screen, uh, you may feel like uh, those 12 projects are not really uh, very much organized. It is true. Uh, our idea, our thoughts are we do not feel uh, it's uh, uh, already the time, uh, we do not feel it's already ready to uh, establish some overarching framework for the standards needed in the areas in the areas of VR and AR. That's why uh, those 12 existing ongoing standards projects uh, look like uh, unstructured uh, because we are uh, performing in a way that uh, uh, whenever we uh, we feel like uh, we feel a standardization need, is feasible, uh, we submit a new PAR and we establish a new project. Uh, we think it's too early to uh, figure out the relationship uh, between uh, lots of uh, standards and uh, uh, draw an overarching uh, picture or structure or framework for the standards. But that could be done uh, in the future, uh, probably in the very um, not very near future, but is uh, still not uh, very far from uh, today, uh, that uh, eventually there might be some overarching framework uh, that will uh, uh, show the relationship uh, among different uh, standards and how they collectively uh, work together uh, to standardize uh, the VR and AR technologies, uh, protocols, uh, and all the relevant uh, components. So the, uh, the first project I'd like to uh, give you a little bit more detail uh, is uh, the 2048.1, which is a device test autonomy and the definitions. Uh, so we all know that uh, there are already many different types of uh, VR and AR devices. Uh, headsets, uh, glasses, and uh, many others, uh, uh, along with those uh, major uh, devices. And also, uh, there has been confusion uh, uh, regarding the <clears throat> term VR and AR and uh, uh, MR and XR, whatever, uh, themselves. So, uh, in some cases, people uh, would even struggle in uh, uh, struggle to uh, argue like a, a particular application. Uh, do you uh, call that an AR or VR or even MR? So uh, such kind of confusion uh, exists in the market. So the uh, one of the purposes of this pro uh, project is to um, specify at least one set of testonomy and the definitions. Uh, uh, to ease this kind of discussion, uh, to serve as a, a base for the discussion. And uh, there are several uh, similar work uh, being done or has been uh, have been done in other SDOs, but uh, our purpose is to uh, develop a new version, uh, probably or likely referencing existing work, uh, but uh, reflecting the understanding and the uh, preference of our working group uh, for the device testimony and the definitions of VR and AR devices. And uh, the next one is about the environmental safety. I know Christine is very interested in this one. So uh, this particular project uh, was uh, initiated before uh, giving the, uh, the, the, the thought that uh, uh, in a VR environment, uh, for example, uh, a classroom, uh, there will be some particular requirements to 
uh, uh, protect the safety uh, of the uh, user and also the people around the user. Uh, so this is a very basic idea behind the, uh, this proposal. And uh, we recognized that uh, uh, such kind of environment safety uh, would also um, be needed uh, uh, in uh, not only VR but also AR, MR. Uh, well, basically, uh, I should say that uh, in my humble opinion, I think MR is just a, a subset of AR. Uh, but that's a, that's a, a mission of the 2048.1 project. So. I just uh, temporarily use the word, uh, use all of them, uh, VR, AR, and MR. So those kind of XRs, uh, they all have environment safety requirements, which is the purpose uh, they need for this project. And uh, actually, I have some, I had some brief discussion with Christine about uh, this project. Uh, so currently, this working group, our working group is working on the consumer perspective. Uh, of the environment safety uh, because we do have the time pressure to deliver this uh, project and also we feel like um, we we need to keep in mind the concept of so-called MVP minimal viable product so uh, we produce a uh, we release a version first and then that could trigger some discussion and uh, revisions additions after that so the first version, the first release of 2048 uh, 8.5 will be about a consumer perspective only. But we do hope uh, our next uh, iteration, our next uh, release uh, could in, uh, integrate uh, enterprise-oriented uh, XR environmental safety. Um, so 2048.7, uh, it's about a map for virtual objects in the real world. So this is a very typical scenario, and uh, I know there are several relevant or uh, similar uh, efforts in other SDOs. Uh, this is actually about uh, the idea is like uh, if you are wearing a Microsoft HoloLens, for example, and uh, you created a virtual object uh, through the interface of your HoloLens, uh, there should be some protocol or a mechanism to enable another person who is wearing, a, let's say, a Magic Leap One, uh, to be able to to be able to see the virtual objects that you just plant in the real world and in, interact with them. So the very uh, basic uh, starting point would be we need a map. Uh, we need a universal map uh, to map all the virtual objects from different vendors, map those virtual objects onto the real world, uh, uh, onto a, a, a universal map. So that's the idea behind the, behind this project. And uh, so uh, I also believe that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the draft of this uh, standard would uh, most likely reference in some existing work uh, being done by other SDOs. But, uh, I do think this will be a, this is a very interesting and uh, valuable project. Oh, by the way, uh, I just uh, use uh, Magic Leap and uh, HoloLens as examples, but uh, uh, recently uh, you can say that uh, more and more uh, application a AR applications are emerging uh, uh, in smartphones. So, like uh, uh, the universal map uh, should, of course, work uh, work with smartphones as well. Like uh, you are using uh, uh, an iPhone or uh, another smartphone from like uh, Google, Huawei, whatever. Uh, yeah, the the vision is that you should be able to interlock with the same virtual, uh, same set of virtual objects uh, planted on the real world. So the P2048.8 uh, is about the interoperability between virtual world, uh, virtual objects, and the real world. Uh, 
this is also a very uh, typical uh, consumer oriented application, but uh, we also uh, feel like uh, there will be some enterprise applications as well. So the idea is that, uh, uh, for example, uh, if you are um, uh, you place a virtual control panel on your uh, real uh, wall, you should be able to use that control virtual control panel to uh, control your like air conditioner or control your other appliances uh, uh, in your home, in your living room, and. Uh, it's very easy to uh, imagine that uh, such kind of interoperability would uh, need some integration uh, 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 of the smart home protocols and standards and uh, other communication standards like uh, uh, PLC, power line uh, communications, like the uh, Wi-Fi, of course, Bluetooth, and uh, uh, other communication protocols and the smart home uh, protocols. But the idea is to, uh, the purpose is to provide a universal, uh, uh, universal uh, protocol, the universal uh, framework uh, for the interoperability between virtual worlds and the real, real world, no matter uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, devices you are using to generate this virtual world and uh, also enable the uh, compatibility of uh, different uh, virtual worlds with different uh, real appliances. Um, like uh, if you put a control panel, a uh, virtual control panel on the wall, and uh, after that, like a uh, uh, mouse, you buy a little appliance, probably a refrigerator in your uh, home. Uh, you should be able to customize uh or add some functions into that virtual control panel to uh enable the, uh, it to be able to interlock with your new uh refrigerator just for example so uh, this is a very um like i said very consumer oriented scenarios but also we will uh we agree there will be enterprise uses use cases as well and uh, so uh, P2048.11, uh, this is the currently the only project uh, that uh, is dedicated to a particular vertical application, which is the vehicular application. Uh, so uh, we are addressing the in-vehicle AR, uh, which means uh, like uh, uh, based on different uh, devices, uh, uh, either the head-up displays or smart glasses, uh, whatever, to provide the AR in, uh, experiences uh, for both uh, drivers and the passengers. So I actually, I personally uh, was not really in favor of this project at the very beginning, because I'm a big fan of uh, uh, pure VR, uh, I have to admit. So I was thinking like, uh, uh, in the future, when everyone is uh, immersed in VR, we don't need mobility, we, we don't need vehicles. But uh, I recognize that uh, that's still far from here. So we still have a stage that we will still need vehicles. So now, uh, so I agreed to support this project, the in-vehicle AR, <coughs> uh, which is about uh, addressing the requirements and the methods for applying AR in vehicles, uh, how they can uh, be integrated into the uh, current uh, systems uh, within a vehicle, within your car, and uh, providing uh, driving assistance and uh, infotain infotainment services, uh, things like that, for the drivers and the passengers. The, the last one I'd like to introduce today is the content ratings and descriptions, uh, descriptors. So this is, a, uh, I, uh, in my opinion, this is the most in interesting and uh, the most interesting project. Uh, so the idea is that we all know that currently in the movie industry and the uh, games industry, uh, there are already content ratings and the descriptors. Like uh, if you watch a movie or TV show or game, 
uh, uh, they always uh, come along with content ratings to to warn you that uh, there are violence in this content there are like uh, you know other sensitive content in this content but uh, VR and AR and MR are raising new questions new issues like for example uh, if somebody uh, has some problem with uh, hate let's say uh, you, if you are afraid of hate and uh, you you just put on a, a VR headset and you are not aware of what kind of content uh, you will be uh, viewing and uh, if all of a sudden you are put on a virtual uh, roller coaster uh, you might have some uh, mental and physical problems if you originally uh, had some problem with hate uh, similar example applies to AR like uh, if you put on a uh, AR headset and uh, uh, you know AR uh, now has some uh, uh, already has some uh, ability to um, fuse the ap appearance of virtual objects and uh, the, the real world so the AR uh, uh, headsets AR devices are also able to uh, make you feel like uh, well uh, there's a, a very very deep uh, hole in front of you on your real floor so you may still have problem uh, if you uh, uh, are afraid of hate so these are examples that uh, uh, given the uh, nature that uh, technologies are pursuing uh, the direction that uh, the virtual objects uh, should be more and more indistinguishable from the real world uh, so VR and AR could generate uh, problems for people who are who have uh, some problems with uh, like uh, afraid of haze or afraid of something else those uh, psychological uh, problems so uh, there should be new set of ratings and uh, descriptors for uh, VR, AR and MR content so that's why we initiated this uh, project um, so um, well basically this is all the projects I'd like to go through in detail today finally this is my uh, email and uh, LinkedIn my email is y.yuan at hbree.org and you can connect me on LinkedIn and uh, you are uh, more than welcome to contact me for uh, participating in our team projects or propose new ones thank you Thank you. Um, thank you, you one that was very, very good and covered all of the uh, information. I think people need um, the right level of detail to, to help them make decisions. We have a few questions that we can uh, take those now. Uh, the, the, uh, I don't remember which slide it was, but it was towards the beginning of the um, presentation you just spoke mm -hmm. about the organizational structure of the IEEE in general and I I didn't catch but would you please tell us about um, the future directions program uh, is it uh, where that is and anything that might be relevant that they're doing what is the purpose of future directions and is there something there about AR and VR okay well that's a very good question so future that directions is a committee under the TA technical activities, so there is a uh, so actually currently have uh, has totally thirteen nine societies and uh, well I think seven or so councils. So collectively, this uh, thirteen nine societies and councils uh, and the seven councils constitute the so-called technical activities board. So there are several committees directly under the Technical Activities Board tab, we call that TAB tab. The Future Directions Committee is one of these committees under tab. So the Future Direction Initiatives, like the Digital Census Initiative that I chaired a few years ago, is supposed to coordinate the activity, activities uh, across the IEEE in a particular future direction area 
Uh, however, future direction uh, initials are not supposed to serve as sponsor so far. I mean, for mm -hmm. for sponsoring standards. So that's why, for example, um, well, um, future direction initiatives uh, will collaborate with uh, society and the councils and also AAASA uh, in terms of uh, if they want to uh, initiate some standards, which means uh, the role of future direction committee is more like a coordinator rather than a managing or overseeing uh, unit. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, one uh, sort of another question at a, a high level. Uh, you mentioned that the IEEE SA, of course, has uh, relationships with other SDOs, and uh, you gave some specific examples when you were detailing some of the projects in P2048. Can you explain to us um, the policies or how the IEEE is related to the International Standards Organization, ISO? Uh, so actually, uh, uh, well, uh, let me use another uh, committee I used to chair as an example. So uh, I used to chair the IEEE uh, Standards Committee on Transportation. Uh, so that committee, uh, we established an official so-called Category A liaison relationship with ISO TSA 204. ISO TSA 204 is the uh, ISO Technical Committee on Intelligent Transportation Systems. So uh, through that liaison relationship, uh, I myself, I named myself as an IEEE representative to attend the ISO TC204 meetings and uh, at their uh, uh, plenary meetings, I typically uh, am supposed to give a, an update uh, or a report regarding what happens, uh, uh, what, what have been happening in my committee. And uh, they are also allowed to send a representative back, although they didn't do that in this example, but they are allowed to do that. So the mm -hmm. category A DS relationship is like uh, uh, creating a condo between those two committees or with, uh, within two different SDOs uh, to enable them exchange uh, information and mm -hmm. uh, in order to what well, I should say, in order to harmonize the outcome. So, I mean, joint, uh, e even we are not uh, uh, jointly developing standards, the such kind of exchange of information would uh, help avoid the situation that we are developing conflicting standards. So that's a basic idea. But uh, okay. uh, there's also um, some other variable, um, uh, purposes, uh, in my uh, in my opinion, uh, it's like uh, so through such kind of condo uh, uh, liaison relationship between IEEE and another SDOs, uh, the standards adoption uh, could be enabled. Like uh, an IEEE standard could be directly adopted by another SDO, uh, vice versa. So, like for example, IEEE eight hundred two. Uh, through the actually uh, through the uh, the uh, liaison uh, relationship with uh, uh, ISO JTC one, that all the actually 802 standards will be well. Uh, probably I should not say all, but I believe it's almost uh, all the actually 802 standards will be adopted by uh, ISO uh, as an mm -hmm. ISO as ISO standards. Uh, and why so, is why are yeah. they special? Why is that group special compared to other? Uh, it's not special. It's just uh, like uh, uh, so. Uh, it's about uh, if you request that or not. I mean, uh, oh, uh, the, 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 the committee leadership. Like for example, uh, I think I mentioned to you that uh, last year we uh, just finished the reorganization of uh, the VRNAR projects and uh, established the VRNAR standards committee. Uh, I do have the agenda to 
establish ESA relationship with the relevant ISO and uh, ITU committees. But mm. some other, uh, uh, this is not really, uh, uh, it's not always true in some other committees. So not all the committee leadership uh, are interested in doing that. So it's mm -hmm. just up to the, so IEEE has such kind of mechanism if a working group level leader, uh, officer, well, I mean, should not say officer, the chair. If a working group chair wanted to uh, want to establish some uh, equivalent uh, liaison relationship with another working group in another SDO, there's process to follow. If we want to establish standards committee level liaison relationship, there is also a process to follow. It's mm -hmm. just uh, up to up to us. But in some cases, like uh, for example, uh, the if we talk about uh, the uh, liaison relationship between uh, IEEE and uh, ISO JTC one, because the category A liaison relationship allows only one focal point, uh, which means the IEEE already has a focal point uh, to the uh, 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 to serve as the liaison uh, representative to uh, the ISO JTC one, uh, I could not be another one. So, which means, okay. yeah, you know. So, uh, uh, there, there has been uh, there there is always a process for <laughs> new liaison relationship, but uh, for existing liaison, uh, liaison relationship, in some cases, uh, uh, they will limit the number of focal points. Thank you for explaining that, and thank you for um, providing this um, very, very comprehensive uh, presentation and the status updates on those um, uh, five uh, projects. Very interesting. Uh, with this, I'd like to conclude today's webinar and remind everybody that the archive will be published and invite you, uh, if you can, to attend the uh, Engineering XR for the Future workshop in Munich on March 5th and 6th. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.